Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. I'm still under the weather, but that's not going to stop me from bringing you the podcast you know and love. Um, I want to say thanks again for so many people reaching out over the past couple of weeks and writing sort of comments and feedback and things like that. I had a very productive back and forth with a listener um, last week who disagreed with a lot of the things we said in the climate change podcast or the e- about electric vehicles in general. And I learned a lot from that exchange. So thank you to him. He knows who he is. And in general, please feel free to keep reaching out. If you want to email me, it's jacob at cognitive.investments. If you haven't reviewed the podcast or given it a rating, please consider doing so. Without further ado for me, here's our normal weekly chat with Rob. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All right, well, listeners, you can probably tell I'm still under the weather. Rob, I've been thinking a lot about Dante's Inferno. I'm sure you remember that the sixth circle of hell is the guy who's upside down in the baptismal font surrounded by mucus. That's what I feel like right now. Does anybody trade mucus out there? I have produced more mucus in the last four days than I feel like I've produced in like in my entire life. I'm sure nobody wants to hear this. How's it going for you? (laughs) Better than that, thankfully. (laughs) <laughs> I bet it is. And I, and I woke up with pink eye this morning, too. If you check it out on YouTube, it actually doesn't look too bad. I've stole my my infant daughter's drops because she had pink eye. I thought I thought I had I thought I had avoided it. It was like a week out. We were good. Anyway, um, again, people don't want to hear about this. Uh, let's start in with um, there's a bunch of stuff happening this week and there's a bunch of headline stuff happening this week and we are going to get to all of it. Um, but when we were talking to just, just sort of prep for the episode, um, Rob brought up that Brazil cut interest rates uh, 50 basis points. And that actually wasn't even on my list. I hadn't even kind of realized that Brazil did that. Um, And I think it's super important. And we'll back into the other sort of headline stuff um, towards the end of the podcast. But I want to start there, Rob. And I I want to tee you up by saying, um, you know, they cut interest rates 50 basis points to 12.75%. And they've been cutting for a while now. Um, but the other thing that I've been tracking with Brazil here over the last couple of months is that inflation in Brazil is going up. So it bottomed out in June at 3.16%. The July reading was 3.99. August was 4.61. So they are cutting rates technically into, uh, do you call that an inflationary environment? Like prices are going up. Um, and the Brazilian economy has been doing well, and yet they are cutting interest rates. So I just want to throw that up to you because I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about how things are different in Brazil versus the West and monetary policy and inflation. But let's start there and, and explain to the listeners why we're starting off with the Brazil story rather than some of the other fireworks that are happening in the world right now. I, I think the takeaway from Brazil cutting interest rates despite inflation going up a little is well, well first of all inflation at four percent by brazilian standards like ha 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 <laughs> i mean <laughs> you'd have to get out your magnifying glass come on um but the fact that it is moving up a little bit and they're still you know continuing with their rate cut cycle i think is a sign of of their confidence that this is not a systemic issue that a lot of these you know factors that are reaccelerating are sort of temporary um temporary factors and not ones that are endemic to the Brazilian economy. Um, And confidence is a really important thing because that's sort of the big, the the bigger issue that I I wanted to explore was the notion of how things are changing over time in not only Brazil, but in some of the, some of the emerging markets, some of the uh, uh, lesser developed nations that we identify here that we research that are on our, 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 our good list as opposed to our naughty list when we do our country-by-country country, um, filter when we implement our investment strategies for clients. Um, and, and I think it points to a bigger opportunity, but also a bigger risk when you look at it in the other direction. And, and I'm going to try to explain this, but I was meeting, uh, I was in London yesterday 
and I, when I was there, I met with a client of ours and he, he, he made an interesting point. He said, you know, I've been talking with these private bankers and they're all coming to me and saying, you have to be in private equity. You have to be in private equity. And he said, um, well, why, why do I have to be in private equity? Um, and they said, oh, well, the returns are higher. He said, oh, is, is that true? And they said, well, if you, if you ease into it over five or six years and you build this ladder and you stay in it for 20 years, then you, you, can't, you can't go wrong. Um, and he, and he, you know, he was sort of picking at this and, and questioning it. But I, I think it's interesting because this is the mantra in wealth management circles and, and asset allocation circles. And a lot of our clients who are in this world will know this, that for the last 15 or 20 years, private equity has been the place to be and has dominated the portfolios of most, you know, real money investors that have big pools of capital to allocate. And the reason why I bring this up in relation to Brazil is I think the assumptions are flipped. And if you want to, my, my thesis is that if you want to make money for the next 20 years, you want to do the opposite of what everyone is doing. Because in the developed world, liquidity is at a huge premium. You have to pay a premium. You have to pay more on average to be in private equity instead of public markets. So mm -hmm. you have to pay a tax to lock up your money for 10 years. That's the state of the market. That's the state of the amount of demand that you know is clamoring to get into private equity markets. And I just think that's so wrong because if you look at what's happening with interest rates, if you look at what's happening in the world and all the things that we talk about, rates are likely to remain significantly higher than they have been, even if they're very volatile up and down over the next 10 years. And today you can earn 5.5% almost in a total liquid way by not locking up your money at all and having your cash in your pocket, essentially. Um, and I think that this is very slow to register. Um, and a lot of people who are locked up or are thinking about locking themselves up for 10 years, I think that's the exact opposite of what you should be doing because now you want to have as much liquidity as you can, not only to take advantage of rates, but also because of the volatility that we've been talking about so much is going to throw up so many opportunities when things get dislocated because capital is scarce in a way that it was not scarce for a whole generation. And that sort of realization is, is creating a big, um, a big opportunity there. So why do I talk about this in relation to Brazil? Because Brazil is the mirror image of this and countries like Brazil. If you were a rich person in Brazil, for most of you know, the last 40 years, you could have made money doing nothing. Capital was so scarce in Brazil. Real interest rates were always high. They were always terrified of inflation. They were always raising rates in anticipation of inflation coming, as we still see today. You know, inflation rates are 4%. Brazilian rates, even after cutting 50 basis points, are 12.75%. Um, so for a long time, you had this kind of rentier class in Brazil and many other places where the rich made money doing nothing. The idle rich. As soon as you had a pile of money, you were set. It was like, you know, Great Britain and, you, you know, you could read the old novels like, oh, he's on a, he's on a, uh, he's on 500 pounds a year because he's bought the, uh, you know, the long-term government bonds. Like that is how it was in Brazil until recently. Because what's happened in Brazil is as the economy has gotten better as things have gotten normalized, as risk premiums have come down and real interest rates have come down over time, you can't do that anymore. You can't just, you can't just do nothing and make a good return. So what you're seeing is, you know, uh, the asset management industry in Brazil is starting to really grow and hedge funds and, and that sort of thing are getting a lot of money because people are looking for ways to make money because now they're panicking. And that, I think, is an interesting opportunity on the other side, because just like liquidity is at an 
unwarranted premium in the U.S., you have to pay up to lock up your money because people are so desperate to lock up their money. In Brazil, it's the opposite. In countries like Brazil, the rich there are terrified of locking up their money. Um, they're terrified of taking entrepreneurial risk in many ways. It's a very conservative uh, uh, environment. Um, people will own real estate because, you know, that will survive anything. But as far as growth investments, as far as sort of this kind of entrepreneurial uh, private equity opportunities that we take for granted in the U.S., that's a very much a fringe element in a lot of these countries. And I guess what I would say is in, in those places, all else equal, of course, you have to look at every individual circumstance, but you want to be locking up now is the time to be taking advantage of some of these tailwinds to lock up your money in those places because you're you're getting paid a big premium to do that whereas here you're paying a big premium um so that's that's my my shtick on brazil this week and it's really important i i'm glad you and first of all when you talked about the ladder i guess ladders are the new pyramids um but you, you mentioned real estate there at the end so is real estate liquid in this definition or is it like how do you think about a real estate investment in the context of what you just just said in either you know the united states or in brazil real estate is a weird thing because real estate is sort of the ultimate um store of value it's not an entrepreneurial risk asset um so if you think in in the brazilian case for example people in brazil love real estate and farms and and things that are tangible, tangible assets, but those are not growth assets. So anytime that you're looking at your investment portfolio, you have essentially two different buckets. You have, what is the bucket that's going to keep you rich? That's going to hopefully preserve its value come hell or high water, you know, but that's not going to grow over time. Then you have your investment bucket, your growth assets what are you actually going to see expansion from um and i think real estate traditionally falls in the former you know people in emerging markets people who are risk averse they love real estate but if you ask them hey you want to invest in this you know provide some growth equity to this uh, manufacturing business that's doing this kind of new thing not in a million years will they give you money for that um, so I think that's the, if I'm explaining that well, if I understood your question, that's, that's how I would mm -hmm. bucket those out. Is there also anything to the, cause one of the stories I feel like I keep coming across, um, is that, you know, as the boomers in the United States and in other developed economies age, they've all built, or not all of them, many of them have built these small businesses that are not interesting enough to the worlds of private equity and all these other things like that, but like small businesses that throw off significant amounts of capital. And you can see on the fringes, people starting to sniff around and buying these smaller businesses and things like that. And it's not, it's, it's sort of the opposite of innovation. It's things like, you know, making siding that you can paint a particular color on the side of your house or the concrete that goes into the, I don't know, like all these sort of weird niche things that throw off like capital and have, and have sustained a family or a group of families for like, you know, decades, but which the kids don't want to take it over because it's not the sexy private equity stuff or the sexy technology stuff. And nobody's kind of waiting in the winds. Where, where does that fall in this spectrum of opportunity you're talking about? Because I would think that if you went after an opportunity like that, you are technically tying up your capital in something. But is that is that more the type of target set that you would be looking for in a place like the United States or in Europe or something like that? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, what you're talking about is roll-up opportunities. So you have all these mom-and-pop businesses in different industries, and of course it depends very much on the industry, but there is a huge generational overhang um, where a lot of the owners are retiring or, or getting too old to work, and who's, who's going to take over the business? So um, that's a big opportunity there's actually there's some innovative um sort of approaches that people are trying to take to that and i don't know how much success they're having but like for example there's um some group in boston i forget what they're called but they have this approach where they essentially they they take an mba student like a young person 
and they say, okay, we're going to back you with some capital. We're going to go buy up a few of these mom and pop companies and try to put them together. And then you run them, like use your MBA training and, and you be the CEO of the new company. Um, mm-hmm. I would guess that that's not working too well because there's a lot of know-how that you need for these businesses that someone, you know, coming out of Columbia Business School probably <laughs> doesn't doesn't know all the nuances of running the siding business in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, but people are trying to figure this out. And there are some uh, areas where it's a huge opportunity because you can consolidate and, and roll these things up and, and basically create scale where there was not scale before. But that I would classify as more of a financial engineering scheme than I, than necessarily like a growth, uh, investment. Mm. Um, so it's a little bit different, but yeah, it, I mean, not only in the developed world, but also, um, pretty much everywhere. That's a, that's a big theme and an opportunity, but obviously you have to be very picky about which industry you're doing it in. Well, and, and it feels like the Achilles heel of, of this stuff is, is like you said, is know-how. I feel like we keep coming back to this human capital and the concept of know-how in general and how we've just, you even mentioned it with this idea about private equity and the low interest rate environment where if you came into financial management post 2008, you've literally never lived in an environment of high interest rates. I was um, you know, hanging out with some ag commodity traders a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about how there's a whole class of young traders who have no idea what interest rates do to trading commodities. They're just, they're getting their faces ripped off because they've never had to deal with this before. Um, so to your point, it, it sounds nice to go buy the siding company in Cleveland, Ohio, wherever it's located. But if you know nothing about siding and they're selling because they're ready to put up their feet and retire and they're not going to give you much help, um, I don't know, either you're going to get a crash course in siding, you're probably not going to be able to do anything because you don't actually have knowledge of the product. And this goes back to deglobalization and China and how we've lost a lot of the technical expertise, whether it's in mining or, you know, all these other small manufacturing type things like that expertise is just not here. It's actually, it's probably the small mom and pops in China that represent the biggest opportunity. <clears throat> Yeah, the Chinese thing is very interesting, too, because we've talked about this all the time, and it's a recurring topic of, you know, will all this manufacturing get moved out of China because of deglobalization and because, you know, the prices are going up and all that. And as time goes on, I get more and more skeptical that it will, and the more that I think about what they've accomplished there. Like, if you look at history, there's plenty of examples of how durable know-how is and this is a bigger topic that i i I think is i'm working on a a white paper some ideas for a white paper on this now but the notion of human know-how and human capital and how that persists even under extraordinary circumstances i think it's a very powerful idea and i think china has been successful in creating one of the few kind of core areas of people who know how to do things um, and have relationships together. Um, just to give one example from history, like not to go down this rabbit hole, because this is a topic for another time, I think. But if you look, there's a, there's a city in France called Limoges. You ever heard of this place? No. So Limoges, I've been, this is like my hobby horse in my reading recently. Um, because I was in the uh, the Petit Palais, one of the museums here, and I saw these incredible enamel plates, these crazy looking plates, and and it said, "Oh, it's from Limoges." And I said, "Oh, well, that's that's interesting." So anyway, Limoges is sort of this town in kind of the middle of nowhere, France, and they today are very famous for their porcelain, but that was not always the case back in the middle ages they were famous for this very specific type of enamel that they would create they would create these sort of relics like golden uh crucifixes and animal Mm. sculptures and stuff like that and they were they were famous all over europe like this was one of the main places to make this stuff you know starting in the in the 11th century right (laughs) and so they had this very specific way of making this and they passed this down generation by generation and they became the center for this, this approach. And then in the Hundred Years' War, um, the Black Prince 
uh, you know, from, from, from England, he came in and he massacred everyone in, in Limoges. There was a famous sack of Limoges as part of the Hundred Years War. I forget exactly which year it was, but it was sufficiently disruptive that basically the whole town got wiped out. And you didn't hear about Limoges for a hundred years. They just fell off the map. They stopped making that stuff. Like the industry had started to decline anyway, like they were just done. And then within about a hundred years after that, in the early 1500s, all of a sudden Limoges is back and they're doing not the original thing that they did, but they're now on the map as, as creating this whole new um, like enamel process that's completely different. Like the, I, 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 for, I forget the technical details, but it would be like if you were a really good blacksmith and then you became like a really great cobbler. Like they were really good at something that was <laughs> kind of similar, but it was a very different process. And then they rose to prominence again doing that thing for like a hundred years. And then something happened and someone found uh, uh, the, the, the basic kind of uh, element that you make porcelain out of near Limoges. So they started taking that and then they became the, you know, the renowned place to make porcelain. So I'm going on and on, but my point is, it's pretty extraordinary how know-how survives and passes from generation to generation, even with the Black Prince coming in and, and slaughtering everyone. And, you know, there's plenty of academic evidence showing that even specific neighborhoods within specific cities tend to persist in terms of their productivity or their, their value add being higher than everywhere else for very, very long periods of time for reasons that are hard to understand. Um, and that's a subject that I'm, I'm just thinking a lot about. And I think it bodes well for the notion that China's manufacturing hub that they've created so successfully in the last 40 years, it's probably going to stick around for a long time. Yeah, I think I, we won't dwell on this too long. I think I've mentioned on the podcast before that I feel like every single child's toy that Annie plays with is, um, is made in China. It's like we know, I, there's one or two like weird Montessori fancy toys that were made in France actually, but other than that, like it's everything is made in China. Down to the like, you hit the little weird robot thing in the button, and even the music is like vaguely Chinese. Like, you can like see Blade Runner happening, like if we do this for another twenty years and things um, things go off the rails. Uh, this is the point in the podcast where if you've made it this far, I will say Peter Zihan this week has declared the end of China is imminent. It is here. He says you have to get out from under the rock and see that the Chinese state is collapsing um so we'll see we'll see if peter's right this time i think it's more likely that china's manufacturing know-how is a more interesting topic to return to in the future um but that's a good first salvo let's um let's turn to some of the other things that are happening in the world before we got on the podcast it's, it's funny you talked about in brazil about change over time and you know we were just talking about france and a, you know going from enamel to porcelain over a period of centuries um, and I guess this is true every week, but I feel like the shadow of history was really casting quite a large um, shadow just sort of over events this week in general. Um, you know, we're going to talk about Nagorno-Karabakh. We'll talk about India-Canada. We'll close up with some thoughts about what's happening with Ukraine right now. I'm getting a little worried about the Ukrainian situation. But maybe we can start with um, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, this is a conflict that I would guess, unless you are a geopolitics nerd in the United States, most people have probably not heard of this. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh is this um, landlocked, what is it? Is it called, it's an, an exclave? or an, I think it's an exclave. I forget what the right word is. Anyway, it's a landlocked territory that is technically in Azerbaijan, but which Armenia claimed and which Azerbaijan claimed and which they've been fighting about for a long time. Um, and this conflict, it go, this conflict literally goes back millennia. Um, the Armenians, you know, used to have a big empire in the South Caucasus and they asserted, I, I think there was even like a, a group here that was not Armenian or like they were non-Indo-European and they were just hanging out in this area. Armenia had some influence. Then, you know, Islam runs roughshod over the reason and the region and various Persian empires are the ones that are exerting control over this part of the world. But they always have this sort of autonomous, you know, yes, we're under the control of Persia, but we have these autonomous princes and things like that. Um, eventually, Persia falls and Russia rises and Russia conquers um, 
parts of this in the early 1800s in a war with Persia. They take uh, parts th this part of the world from Persia around that time. Um, and eventually you get to this point where Russia becomes the Soviet Union. Um, they have Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, all of these Soviet republics get founded and they decide to stick Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan, even though there's lots of Armenians there. Fast forward, you know, almost another century, the Soviet Union begins to fall apart and boom, now we have the first Nagorno-Karabakh war where Armenia says, okay, like the Soviets put this in Azerbaijan, but really it should be Armenian territory and we want it. And the Azerbaijan is saying, no, 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 this is our territory, we're taking it. And they've literally been fighting on and off since 1994. Um, and what has happened this week, and it's been sort of a slow motion process, um, but at the beginning of the week, Azerbaijan, it, it was it was hard to get um, sort of tangible information about what they were doing, but it was obviously some kind of offensive in the region where they were going and going after, um, you know, key posts and things like that. And with, within 48 hours, Nagorno-Karabakh has basically surrendered. And so there are protests in Armenia because they're angry at the Armenian prime minister for giving it up. Um, Russia's trying to say that they were part of the deal that was negotiated and that some of their peacekeepers died. Uh, that sort of a whole thing. Erdogan and Turkey is in the background saying they support Azerbaijan's uh, moves here. Um, but the, the long and short of this is that Azerbaijan, it looks like, has finally taken Nagorno-Karabakh and there's no argument about it anymore. Like they're just going to have it. And for me, the big, well, the, there's one big flashing takeaway and there's one speculative thing that I will talk about and then I'll, I'll pitch it up to you for sort of you know, the air freight portion of this. The big blinding picture thing here is that this is what it looks like as Russia is going to collapse. Like we already had the Prigozhin incident. Now we have Russia, which is supposed to be supporting Armenia as a defense treaty ally and everything else, basically just washing their hands of the South Caucasus. And you even have Russian you know, media criticizing and making fun of the Armenians for not being willing to defend themselves. Well, they thought they had you, Russia, to defend them, and they didn't have them at all. That's sort of the big blinding big picture thing. I think we need to be thinking about what the recession of Russian power in the South Caucasus, in Central Asia, in the Balkans, what that's going to look like over the next couple of years. And here's your first big sort of chapter one, the recession of Russian power after the Russia-Ukraine war, Azerbaijan takes Nagorno-Karabakh. The second sort of much more speculative thing here is I wonder if this is not yet another sign of a small break with Turkey and Russia. Um, Turkey has been saying for, I guess it's literally months now, hey, Russia's not going to end the Black Sea Grain Initiative. There's going to be a new Black Sea Grain Initiative. The Turks think of, the Turkish government, I should say, think of the Black Sea Grain Initiative as their big diplomatic success and that they, they were going to get Russia back into it and get grain flowing for the rest of the world. And Vladimir Putin keeps on coming out and saying, no, we're not going back into the Black Sea Grain Initiative until we get X, Y, and Z from Europe, a list of completely unrealistic demands that Europe's never going to bend to. And so Erdogan's just sort of stuck out there saying, okay, Black Sea Grain Initiative and Russia's saying no. And the reason I, I offer this speculation is because Turkey is supporting Azerbaijan. And I don't think, my guess, and I don't know this for sure, because the Aliyev clan, which runs Azerbaijan, has its own ideas. I have a hard time believing that Azerbaijan would have gone after Nagorno-Karabakh if they didn't know that Turkey had them if things got a little squirrely. Um, which tells me maybe Turkey is showing Russia and the South Caucasus, okay, like we've been very pragmatic and very nice with you and we still want to be very pragmatic and nice with you. But if you're going to push our buttons, like don't forget we can push your buttons in some parts of the world too. We may not be quite as strong as you. We may not want to pick a fight, uh, but we can certainly you know, embarrass you as well if you want to embarrass us in the global stage. So I don't know. That's very speculative. I have no evidence for that. It's just, I, I wonder if that's something that's into it. But I also, I wanted to start with this one, Rob, because I know we put out an in-focus piece at the beginning of this year and um, maybe talk a little bit about it. And maybe the in-focus piece, maybe the threat is over. Like if Azerbaijan's just going to take over Nagorno-Karabakh and the, the war is already over and the territories claim, maybe the concerns about airspace, uh, they were legitimate concerns, but we uh, we overestimated Armenia's capability to do anything in the face of Azerbaijani force. But um, I thought I'd lay it up to talk to you about that portion of it as well. Yeah, well, this is an interesting case because it's really one where geopolitics immediately impacts um, economic activity in a very specific way. So what I mean is like... Um, and, and not to throw it right back to you, but what is your, how do you think about cases like this? Because you mentioned this has been going on for millennia, literally. Um, I, w I was just reading about this, like during 
during the end of the Byzantine Empire, how the, in this area there was just constant, because in, and this, the players are all basically the same, you know, Turkey, Russia, the Persians, and that's where they all meet. So that's where they always fight, and their proxies are always fighting. So as Russia gets weaker, do you anticipate, like, getting to your question, is this the end? Is it just, oh, okay, well, they just gobbled this up, and now it's just done? Or do you anticipate more friction along here as the bigger powers, the Turkey, the Russia, um, sort of feel each other out more more actively? Or, or there's more, you know, the tectonic plates are rubbing against each other because there's because people sense that Russia's weak or something's changing, whereas, you know, it's not just strong, stable powers and status quo. Um, because if so, that's, this is a key, it's a key choke point um, on the air side, um, which answer my question and then I'll, I'll explain the air thing so I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I think the answer to your, there's two answers to your question. The more macro answer to your question is absolutely, but it's almost in some ways tectonic plates is not the, or maybe that's a good metaphor, I'm not sure, because just because the plates are running in one place doesn't mean that's where the earthquake is gonna be. So for example, I think it looks to me, if the reports we have today, it's Thursday, September 21st, you know, we could get different reports tomorrow over the weekend. It looks to me like Azerbaijan has run roughshod over Nagorno-Karabakh. They've conquered it, Nagorno-Karabakh has surrendered, Armenia's given up the goose, Russia says they're not defending it. Turkey says they're supporting Azerbaijan. I mean, unless you get some kind of insurgency within Nagorno-Karabakh, which probably is not there, they're probably just accepting their fate one way or another, probably the fighting here is over. I mean, maybe, like I said, maybe it's an insurgency, but it's not like, it's not what we were worried about, which was war between two states with Russia supporting one state and Turkey and the other, and do we get artillery and do we get air forces involved and all those other things. That said, um, yes, there's going to be friction along the plates all over the place. So now that Turkey and Azerbaijan have, you know, done this in the South Caucasus and Russia has said, okay, well, we, we couldn't do anything about it. Do we then look over to the Balkans and does Russia try and prod something over there? Or does Russia try and stir the pot with Syrian Kurds or something like that in parts of the Middle East? Do we get into central, like, does, uh, does, does Russia try to use its relationship with Iran to try and cause problems for Turkey? Like, I think maybe the at least today, it looks to me like the the immediate threat looks like it's a little bit lessened. But yes, we're absolutely going to see friction over time uh, between all of these powers. And my bet is that Russia is going to be on the losing side of that equation every single time. That countries like Poland, like Turkey, like Iran, like Kazakhstan, like these, like China, these are the countries that are going to do well um, as Russia basically just sort of fights. I mean, it's not even a Pyrrhic victory here, right? They just lost. So maybe they'll have some Pyrrhic victories along the way, but I don't see how Russia reestablishes itself um, in these parts in, in these parts of the world that it's dominated for 200, 250 years. Well, it's definitely worth watching to see what sort of trouble they can stir up, as you point out. Maybe it's not, maybe it's uh, more insurgency style trouble uh, along the margins, but... Um, the reason why uh, this is such an important area and people who have never heard of Nagorno-Karabakh should care about this is because of the way global supply chains have shifted in, in the recent years and especially during the war. So um, if you try to picture a map, picture a map of Central Asia or of the world, and if you want to fly a plane from the population centers of China um, to Europe, you have to do so in a way that's sort of curved because the earth is curved. You can't just fly straight. So what they usually do is traditionally they would fly from say Hong Kong and they would fly over Ukraine or over Russia and then into Europe uh, in that direction. Now you can't do that anymore because unless you're a Chinese plane, which continues to have um, uh, access to Russian airspace, all the European carriers are barred from flying over Russia, and probably with good reason. No one can fly over Ukraine because it's a war zone. So you have, if you picture this, you know, on, imagine you're in Hong Kong and you're looking at Europe, the whole right side of your screen is now off limits. So what's on the left side of the screen? Well, you have Iran, 
which no one can fly over Iran ever since they shot down a plane in 2020. Um, so you can't go over Iran. And then a little bit beyond Iran, you have Syria, um, which if you look at a, at a map and actually the, the European um, Air Traffic Control Agency has, has done a big presentation on this and you can look this up. And they have a map of all the GPS jamming and spamming uh, being done. All of the hot spots of that map are all over Syria and and that area. So GPS spamming and is is essentially where you're um, you're giving false GPS coordinates to to a plane. Uh, jamming is when you just shut the GPS off. Spamming is when you're actually giving false coordinates. So there was a case um, within the last couple of years where there was a plane that was flying over the ocean uh, outside of Ukraine and their GPS was telling them that they were like 30 miles inland. Uh, hmm. So you can see how this could be a problem and you want to avoid these areas uh, where you could get GPS spammed and essentially where there's insurgencies, where there's bad actors, that's where this is happening. So if your whole right side of your screen is blocked off and your whole left side of your screen is Iran or Syria, then that leaves a very narrow part in the middle where you can get from Southern China to Europe. And in order to do that, you basically have to go over Baku, Azerbaijan. And that is the, the flight control area that is now handling almost every flight that goes from Asia to Europe because it's the only way you can go. Um, and we wrote about this in January and pointed out like, hey, this is, this is a potential risk. You know, if you think of the ever given moment where, you know, the ship went Ooh. sideways in the Suez Canal and it was havoc, there's a risk of an ever given moment in the air because there are hundreds of planes coming through this very, very narrow choke point. Um, and first of all, Baku, I think, to some extent, is struggling just to manage the flow because you have to na uh, you have to orchestrate all of this air traffic, and it's a huge it's a huge job. Um, but on top of everything else, if there's any accident, if there's any GPS spamming going on within that area itself, especially in regard to this conflict that we're talking about right now you could have a major problem on your hands. So that's, that's a risk that no one is really talking about. But if you're managing a business or you're managing supply chains and you have any reliance on stuff that's going through the air, so that's electronic components, high value materials that are shipped, uh, fresh goods, um, this, is, this is your choke point here because you can't get there really any other way otherwise you have to go all the way down through saudi arabia and the planes can't go that far they have to stop and refuel and it's too far um so yeah you should care about nagorno karabakh and and what's going on here and, and it has real implications for people doing real stuff i noticed you said that the earth is curved i take it kyrie irving's time as a member of the boston celtics did not convince you that the earth is actually flat is that did i hear you correctly there Rob? because if the earth is flat there's no problem right we can just just go anyway bad flat earther joke um before we leave this general topic um because I, I think the ukraine thing sort of dovetails here uh, I'm a little worried, uh, and I think Zelensky should be worried about some of the developments of the past couple of weeks when it comes to Ukraine. You've got the United States saying they're not going to give a major weapons system that Ukraine was asking for. You've got uh, this continued friction between Poland and Ukraine over grain, where Poland has been banning imports of Ukrainian grain. Ukraine says it's going to go sue them in the WTO. Poland came out today and said, all right, well, we're not giving any more weapons to Ukraine right now. We need to replenish the stocks of the Polish army which that could be true to say it out loud to, to like that. That's a political statement about where Poland's feeling about support there. You've got elections coming up in Slovakia. Slovakia has been one of the most outspoken, both in terms of rhetoric, but also in giving weapons and things like that to the Ukrainians. You've got the leader in the polls right there as a populist who says that Slovakia is a country of peace and he doesn't want to send another round um, 
to Ukraine to further a war that is just killing people. And then sort of zooming back out, if you look at approval ratings in some select European countries for economic and financial sanctions against Russia and on sending arms to Ukraine, um, it's declining across the board. So, so in March 2022, for example, Poland was 91% approval for both economic sanctions against Russia and providing arms to Ukraine, down to 86% and 80%. So, I mean, that's still a lot of support, but also a market decline. A little more concerning, though, if you look at a country like Italy. So they've gone from 80% in March 2022 um, to, for economic sanctions and 57% support of arms. That's now 65% and 49%. That's a pretty precipitous decline. The other one, uh, both Germany and France, you go from, let's just talk about weapons for these two. So um, in 2022, France, uh, let me just, uh, 65%, now 54%. Germany, 66%, now 52%. That's bad for Zelensky. Um, and I've, it, it also means I would be wrong if this continues to play out because I've been thinking the United States is not a long-term viable partner for Ukraine because eventually the U.S. electorate will get bored of this, and you can already see it playing out in U.S. domestic politics. But I've also been saying I think Europe is the actor that is going to support Ukraine to the hilt because they need Ukraine. They're thinking about integrating Ukraine into the EU, all these other things. And if those poll numbers keep declining at that level, I don't care what Macron and Scholz and everybody else think, like eventually they're going to get punished at the ballot box if they continue providing this level of support for Ukraine and Ukraine's offensive doesn't show um, the results that we're seeing. So um, we start off with the recession of Russian power, and that means bad things for Russia things don't look especially good for Ukraine right now either. And that decline in political support says disturbing things for Ukraine and not great things about some of our projections about what's happening in the European Union right now. <clears throat> what do you attribute the decline in support to? Is it just getting tired of it? The perception that it's becoming a quagmire? What is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... I mean, we're beginning to see an uptick in energy prices again. We're beginning to see some upticks in food prices again. It's been going on for a long time and people are sort of getting tired of it. I think there's also something to be said for sort of psychologically, this was a crisis. And so both the European Union and the United States have moved decisively to answer the crisis. It's like, oh, yep, here's 100 billion euros and here's, here's the tanks and here's the weapons. Um, but, you know, what about basic infrastructure and regulations in the EU? What about spending all this EU next generation recovery money. Um, I said over a year ago, I started worrying about this because the Biden White House, okay, here's here's 100 billion or 50 billion or whatever it was for Ukraine. Uh, and here's just maybe, I forget what the exact number was. It was something like 40 or 50 million for the flooding crisis or the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi. And it's like, eventually all that's going to add up. If you're spending 50 billion for the Ukrainians, but you're not fixing basic infrastructure in that country because, oh, we have to go through the regulations because it's not a war with Russia and blah, 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 blah. Like, I would imagine that psychologically that builds up over time. Um, so probably a combination of all of those things. Um, but no, no matter, you know, in general, the, I think the support level is still high. And it's, it's funny, the political leaders have really latched on to this. Like we put something on the knowledge platform this week about how Macron has basically given up on Russia before he wanted to be the great mediator. Now he's sort of flipped. He sort of thinks, oh, Putin was lying to me the whole time. Now he's talking about, oh, that we're going to produce this new policy about how we're going to support Ukraine to the bitter end. Um, so it's, it's this weird sort of flip where the poll numbers are starting to decline a little bit, but maybe the leaders are a little more well ensconced. It would be very on brand for Macron to, uh, <laughs> to choose now as the moment to support the Ukrainians the most when the polls are starting to decline in general. So, but I don't know, those are just guesses. Well, how do you think the rubber hits the road as far as action? Because, you know, polls don't necessarily translate into action on the ground. I would imagine they have some leeway with their current, to the extent they have military assets to, to try to support them in some way. Um, like what are the tangible outcomes if, if Macron tomorrow realizes, hey, politically it's not a good idea to be pushing the pro-Ukraine message too visibly. Like does that drastically cut the ammunition that Ukraine is receiving? Like, do you have any sense of the actual plans that are in place and how they might be derailed? 
I mean, the U.S. is more important right now for that. So the European, I think the idea is that the Europeans would step up and do it over the long term. And I should say, like Sweden came out, I think it was last week or something, they want to build military vehicles in Ukraine. So it's not, you know, some countries are still looking at this and seeing opportunity in general and not politics. But no, I don't think that if you had a European country change its mind overnight that you would see a big change. If the U.S. decided tomorrow to stop supporting Ukraine, you probably would see a big change. But my whole point has been, the U.S. is probably not going to do this forever. Maybe you've got another 12 months. So you've got to figure out if you're Ukraine, can I get enough weapons from Europe? Can I produce enough weapons indigenously? Can I steal enough weapons from Russian positions so that if U.S. support starts to waver because you have a new president or because Biden wants to respond to poll numbers and things like that, if you start to get, or just because U.S. stockpiles get exhausted. I mean, the U.S. is not able to produce ammunition and things like that at the rates that it used to be in Russia. That's the one thing that Russia seems to be able to do, although I have questions about the quality of that stuff. So it's it's not an imminent thing, but it does sort of tell you, um, you know, Ukraine has a it's, it's not, they can't just do this indefinitely. Um, we're running out of time here for the offensive so far, because once we get to winter, it's going to be very hard to fight. But, you know, if we get to this time next year, and this is still the tenor of the conversation, that starts to be the type of war of attrition that I'm not sure Ukraine can deal with if Russia is still a stable actor there. So. Well, geez, according to Matt Pines, we have all these deep state programs for aliens. Can't we just kind of slip Ukraine 50 billion and put it in a footnote or something? Like, will people notice in the 950 billion U.S. defense budget? I am sure that the aliens have heard your argument and that they will take it into account. Um, let's, let's close with just, a, again, in keeping with the theme of the shadow of history sort of casting, I, I want to say the shadow of history casting something casting its image because ca i can't say the the shadow is casting its shadow i'm really messing up there with my words anyway um so the other big thing that's happened this week is um this diplomatic spat between india and canada um canada apparently thinks that india the indian government or people tied to the indian government helped assassinate or kill some kind of sikh nationalist who wants an independent Sikh state within India, um, that these Indian government, I don't know, officials is the wrong word, but some with people with ties to the Indian government helped murder this person on Canadian soil and that this person was a Canadian citizen. And apparently Trudeau confronted Modi about this at the G20 privately, and India basically told Canada to fuck off and said, you've been like allowing support for these guys for way too long in your own country. Our diplomats get harassed every time they're there by these people. Like we don't give, like maybe you should look in the mirror. And Trudeau responded by going in front of sort of Canada's legislature and giving a very, very strong speech about how this was a violation of the rule of law, that Canada is a rule of law country, that India can't be doing this. Um, he didn't make the direct comparison to Saudi Arabia chopping up Khashoggi in Turkey, but I mean, the comparison was sort of right there. Um, in response, you've had them both withdraw diplomats, ambassadors from each other's countries. Um, there had been a number of free trade negotiations towards an eventual free trade agreement between Canada and India this year already. That's all done. Canada's not making their next trade mission visit there. And according to India, the trade, the trade deal is kind of off the table. Um, you've had sort of still more problems brewing now between um, India and Canada in general. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about history. Uh, because this goes back not quite millennia. Um, it doesn't look like, and I, I apologize, I'm probably going to piss. We, we've talked about Azerbaijan and Armenia. I'm sure the, the social media hives on both sides will come at me for saying things wrong. Same thing ha happens with India. Like you say a word about Modi and they think that you're saying something bad, they'll come at you. And I'm sure Sikhs who nationalists, if they happen to listen to this, maybe they'll come after me too. But based on what I understand about this, not an expert, but I was digging a little bit into this earlier this week. Um, it doesn't look like this idea of Sikh independence has been around quite as long as Nagorno-Karabakh. It looks like it goes back to the formation of a Sikh empire in the Punjab area around the late 1700s, early 1800s. The British come in um, and destroy this empire and it gets sort of looped in to bigger British India. Fast forward to when India becomes independent, the way that the British decided to do this, um, and this is, uh, we have the wreckage of this still in the Middle East, we have it in India too. It was by sort of majority religion in different 
parts of the country. And the Sikhs did not have a majority in any part of the country. And so there were some Sikhs who wanted to go back to the Sikh empire and reclaim sort of an independent Sikh state. And they couldn't do it because it was, you had Hindu India and then eventually you had Muslim Pakistan, Bangladesh comes out in the thing. But so the Sikhs are sort of the big losers here. Um, and over the last, you know, half century, three quarters of a century, this thing pops up um, and it arguably reached its biggest crest in the 1980s when um, then leader of India, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, she basically sent Indian troops to remove a Sikh leader from a holy place in the Punjab because he was talking about all the separatist stuff. Um, two of her Sikh security guards assassinate her a couple of days later or the next day, I forget the exact timeline. Um, and you get all these riots between the Indian government and the Sikhs in general. So you've had these sort of um, ebbs and flows with it. Um, Sikh separatism, as far as I know, was not tied to the agricultural reforms that failed in India, but a lot of those protesters were Sikh farmers in the Punjab. So maybe they didn't have the, the flags of, um, I think it's Khalistan that they're I'm probably mispronouncing that, but, um, you know, they didn't have the flags of their independent Sikh state that they were waving about. But one of the reasons that Modi's agricultural reforms failed was because the Sikhs said, no, we're not doing this. Like this sounds stupid to us. Um, and that sort of brings us to right now. It's a very, very difficult position for Canada. It's um, not necessarily a difficult position for India, but if you're the United States, you've been trying to build this Indo-Pacific framework and Indo-Pacific alliance to resist China and everybody's going to India and talking about how they're going to invest in India and things like that. And now instead of talking about that, we're talking about how India and Canada look like they're on the brink of not having diplomatic ties. And does the United States support its NATO ally and neighbor or does it support India or does it try and be hands off and not do anything? Um, so here again, sort of, you know, issues that have been around for hundreds of years and societal tensions and cultural tensions and all these other things. Like it is not a coincidence that all these things are happening as we see this multipolar world emerge on the fringes. I think you'll see these sorts of things happening and, um, not a good, not a good week for Canada, India relations for Western India relations and arguably for India in general, I think. Yeah, it's a really tricky situation because when you think about this multipolar world and different governments having relations, economic relations, and otherwise, I mean, it's this, it's a very similar thing to the China argument, which is, can the U.S. and China live side by side? You know, can an authoritarian regime interact on a daily basis with a non-authoritarian one? Will that actually work? And it's not to say that India is an authoritarian regime, but, you know, there are authoritarian elements in there, and, you know, it's, it's no secret. Um, you know, was was Canada right to do that? Um, not, I don't know. I, 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 what do you think? Should they have made a big um, deal about it? Are, are values the hill that you should die on or stand on? Or in a multipolar world, do you have to put... Do you have to be much more Machiavellian about these things? What would you do if you were the dashing uh, president of Canada? D yeah, dashing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble with people no matter what I say. So let me just say right now, we're, we're trying to get at this from an objective level. I'm trying to just give you analysis. I'm not an expert in Sikh history, as you can probably understand. I'm, be, I'm coming up to speed quite as fast as I can. But trying trying to come from that objective political point of view, even though it is, is hard in some of these things. So um, is it right? I don't know. That's a question that's above my pay grade. It's really interesting that Trudeau decided that he needed to go public with this um, because you can't really unring that bell. And it is something that he has done a few times now. So go back to 2018, you've got a that Canadian, I think, embassy or something like that made that tweet about Saudi Arabia and human rights and women's rights. And boom, suddenly you have a diplomatic spat with Canada and Saudi Arabia and expelling students and blocking trade and blocking investment. They only patched that up um, in the last couple of months. Or go back to China, uh, excuse me, Canada arresting uh, that Huawei CFO from China because the United States had an ex extradition request in place. Now, was that extradition request kosher? Like you can kind of go back and forth, but then you had Canada and China, really bad economic relations, political relations kind of tank. So Canada has kind of a record of doing this under Trudeau's government. Um, I would say that most of the time um, when you have countries that are making foreign policy based on principles or 
they're justifying their moves based on principles. Um, you usually have to be a pretty strong country because there's going to be backlash here. And I think the thing that is confusing to me about Canada is that Canada, no offense, Canadians, you're a middle power. You're not the United States. Like if a country, so you've, you've pissed off China. If you're going to piss off India too, like those are major trade markets. There's a reason you're in free trade negotiations with them. You want to trade lots of goods with them. And the Indian government even said this this week when they shut down free trade negotiations. It doesn't matter to them. Canadian Indian trades like $8 billion, I think roughly total. They don't care. Everybody wants to trade with them. They're a billion people. They're huge. They're the country of the future. They could care less about what Canadian farmers or Canadian energy exporters or, you know, Canadian companies want to, uh, you know, reshore to India and things like that. It's, it's nothing to them. Whereas for Canada, it's actually a much bigger deal. Cause if you're trying to find these new markets, you're trying to get more independence from the United States in general, you're trying to build the economy. Um, if you piss off enough people, maybe it's bad. Now that said, like if, if India, if this is true, if India is running around assassinating Canadian citizens, no matter what their viewpoints are, I mean, that's really hard to tolerate. And this goes back to something we've talked on and off and warned clients about on and off. You can also see how national borders are starting to matter less and less. This is not the first time we have had another country go into a different country and arrest someone or kill someone or detain someone because of, you know, something that they wanted or because of their own political views. You can't really imagine that happening in the kumbaya globalization world of 30 and 40 years ago. But, you know, just think about that journalist who was flying over Belarus that they took down because they made them land the plane and took the guy off the plane and arrested him and let the plane go back. You can go to the Khashoggi affair. Now we can do this. There's a disturbing trend of governments maybe not recognizing national borders if they're trying to, to do something from that score. But um, I wrote an article, or I didn't write an article. I, I wrote a, a recap of this for some Canadian clients. And um, the, the last line of the of the article was, you know, this is the cost of principled foreign policy in unprincipled times. And I leave it to you all to decide whether that was the right move, whether it was the wrong move. Um, I immediately got like three emails saying, Just, uh, Trudeau has no principles whatsoever. He's never had any principles. He sucks and he's risking Canada's future and all he cares about is himself and he's a narcissist, narcissistic bastard. Um, I've never met the dude. Narcissism is also a principle in and of its own right. So if it's the, if it's the Trudeau party and he wants to continue the Trudeau party going, I think the point still stands. It's still about making um, policy ideologically. Um, but I don't know. I, I can make the case both ways. I can see how you would have a real politic reaction to this. I can also see how if you raise this in private channels with India and they basically told you not just, not only did they not apologize, but they also said, actually, you're the problem. I can see how that would piss you off and how you'd want to stand up for the rule of law. So, um, but I think the, the upshot of it, the upshot of it is that it's going to hurt Canada. Um, it poses a major problem for the United States because now it has these two countries that it's trying to have close relationships with who are going to sort of be at each other's throats. And for India, Canada is not that big of a deal for India, but I do think that the Modi government needs, well, I'm not going to say that. The Modi government is risking its public image a little bit here in the West. The West has given India a pass on things like Kashmir and on some of these other issues. And India is a democracy. And it's being remade by Modi into more of a Hindu nationalist majority state rather than this tapestry of diversity. There are good things and bad things to that. So if you're a Modi lover, don't think that I don't see some of the good. Like Modi wants to eliminate caste or not eliminate. Or I don't I don't know if eliminates the right word, but it's really trying to trying to downgrade the importance of caste within Indian society. Cool. Every Western liberal, if they understood any of the words I just said, is probably giving you a thumbs up. Uh, good that you want to unify the tax code and that you want all Indian states to have the same rule of law and all these other things. These are some of the reforms that Modi's trying to push through. The flip side is Hindu nationalism, like all ideologies, has a dark and radical side to it as well. And if you're going to move towards a Hindu nationalist India, even if 70 or whatever percent of the country is overall Hindu, this is a country with hundreds of millions of Muslims. We just talked about the Sikhs a little bit a while ago. Usually minorities do bad when an ethnic majority is taking over and ruling from the sort of nationalist majority perspective. So maybe India remains a democracy, all these other things, but the, the India that is emerging before us, maybe it's a stronger, more competent, more economically successful one. And maybe it's also one that it's a little more uncomfortable for your Apples and your Microsofts to actually deal with when they actually look underneath the hood. And the question there is, are you going to look underneath the hood? Are you going to treat Kashmir the same way that we treat China and Hong Kong? 
I know there are problems with that comparison, but there's also some similarities too. So you asked me if it's right. I have no clue. I can make the argument in five different ways to Sunday. Um, but I do think it points to sort of some of the tangible things like multipolar sounds like an abstract concept. Here it is. Here it is for you tangibly and how it's going to affect trade and economic flows and the lives of farmers and the lives of oil exporters like in real time. It's the sort of stuff you have to prepare for. Just to sort of shift gears on that a little bit, I asked you if you thought it was right and sort of we framed it as Trudeau doing the right thing versus the pragmatic thing or, you know, in, in that kind of way. Here, here's a theory, and it's probably wrong, because I don't think it really applies to the Huawei example. But what if it is a pragmatic move? So here's, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there as a playful theory, not one that I necessarily believe very strongly in. Um, mm -hmm. Canada has been an immigration boom town for the, for the last, mm -hmm. you know, two decades. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it's it's been a backdoor way for the U.S. to get immigration that it desperately needs, but politically struggles to get from other countries. But that's a whole other mm -hmm. separate subject. But if you look at all of the stuff that's driving growth in Canada, you know, look at Vancouver, look at Toronto. Immigration has been a huge boon for them. They're getting tons of immigrants from India, from China, from all over the world. And I just wonder, is it possible that this is a pragmatic move to stand up and say no 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 like other regimes in the world you can't come in here and touch our high value immigrants because like no one would think no one would dare to do that in the u.s for example it's canada trying to set a standard of hey we're going to really do everything in our power to to protect these people in order to make a statement and and uh be seen to be standing up for what is really a valuable economic asset for them. You're right that the Trudeau government has prioritized like making Canada an attractive place for immigrants to come to, and they've had a lot of success. And it also breeds, you know, these sorts of problems and things like that. I also, I don't want to sort of skirt over like there are folks, especially in Western Canada, who hate all of this. Um, who feel like they're struggling and feel like the Trudeau government is all about highfalutin principles and doesn't actually take care of Canadians. And, you know, why are we worrying so much about immigrants when we have problems in Canada in general? So, um, but it's an interesting theory. Um, certain, like, like most developed countries, Canada is facing demographic issues. And if you want to get a demographic shot in the arm, making your country a hospitable place for immigrants, maybe it's politically controversial today. 10, 15 years from now, when we're that much older and that much grayer and we need more laborers and things like that, the countries that have been able to make themselves friendly to um, especially a high skilled immigrants are probably going to do better in the grand scheme of things. But that that's a political, I mean, you're really standing on a political knife right there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's viable, but you know, it's also the, the, the flip side of that is that Trudeau doesn't have a lot of support in Canada. I believe he's at the head of a minority government right now. He's made a lot of different missteps. The The opposition to him has gotten louder and louder. I've also seen the theory out there that he's really just, he keeps on using these foreign escapades to try and distract from the fact that he's hemorrhaging support in Canada itself. And he's been able to hold on just because nobody's risen to challenge him and his coalition is still strong enough to give him sort of the largest seat at the table. But he's not as powerful as he was five years ago. And I doubt we're talking about him in the next couple of years if things continue on this trajectory. So, um, but I like the theory. I mean, it's it, it holds in terms of the Trudeau government's priorities, but that's also probably why a lot of Canadians are so vocally against him. I, again, not gonna say whether that's good or bad. That's uh, That's for a different time. Well, that's good. We covered a lot of ground. Anything else you want to uh, talk about, Rob, before I go break out my, my neti pot? My most intimate relationship relationship in my life right now is with my neti pot. Sorry if that's TMI for y'all. So uh, <laughs> anything else before we get out of here? No, that was a nice um, hop around many different places of the world. Nagorno-Karabakh and Sikh separatism and Brazil and Ukraine. And I think we've, we've, we've covered it pretty well for this week we've outdone ourselves all right well hopefully i'm back with my normal voice next week uh we'll see you then 
Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.